What does a guy that studies ancient civilizations and rocks have to do with uh, breakthrough energy and new energy and free energy? Everything. Because it seems that we're finding more interesting answers to the questions of new energy and breakthrough energy and free energy from the distant past than what we're finding today. And this is what I'm going to be unveiling today because this is incredible breakthrough information that needs to be shared with everyone. And I believe we're sitting right on the edge of truly giving the world a deep understanding of free energy by exploring the past. But unfortunately, we remain a species with amnesia. And uh, this is a big problem for us. We have no idea who we are, where we come from, and why we're here. And in this um, deep state of amnesia, we forget that we can look at the past to learn about what we should be doing about the future. And this is really what I'm going to try and do here, is to connect the dots, to see what we can learn from ancient civilizations that can benefit us not only today, but into forming the kind of utopian future that we all believe we should have as living, breathing human beings, and not pieces of paper called um, uh, straw men and things like that, or legal, legal fiction and things like that which I might get into if there's time at the end. So, um, the Breakthrough Energy Movement, here we are, it's the second year. I was in Holland last year, and so I come here with a, with a heart filled with joy and hope, but at the same time I come here with deep sadness, because where have we gone in one year? Absolutely nowhere. The same talk about free energy and promise, and six months down the road, and twelve months down the road, and nothing has materialized. And that, that is fundamentally what I have a big, big problem with. And the reason why things aren't materializing is because of the greed of humanity. And this thing called money that keeps getting in the way. So my suggestion, because I'll probably forget to bring this up later, is this is a message to all the inventors, the scientists, the, the bright minds out there that are developing free energy devices. Forget the word funding. Forget the word production lines. Forget the word getting Patents uh, launched in favor of yourself for your, for your thing that you've developed. Give it free to the world, people. It's all about free energy. Okay? If you give it out for free, write down the specifications, show the models, show how it works, make sure that you can push at a push of a button, you can share this with the entire world within seconds. That is your best form of protection. Because if you do not do this, you may just disappear. And the same kind of horrible thing is going to start happening to you the more you close the information to the rest of the world. Share your information. Let the spreading of this become your own security. And I speak from personal experience here going up against the banks in South Africa because I believe the reason why I'm still standing here is because we made everything as public as we could. Every single time we were in court, we broadcast the, the court files, the, the audio files. We made sure that everything went out uh, on the internet to everybody as quickly as possible. So, new energy. We are searching for free energy. That's the key word here. Free energy. Why are we searching for free energy? One of the most important areas that I see we're completely ignoring here, most of, most of us are ignoring this, is the <coughs> source of energy, and that is sound. The source of all things in the, in, in the universe, sound and resonance. And the reason I say this is because this seems to be the primordial source of all things, from whence all things come. Free energy. Why are we looking for it? Because we've discovered free energy over and over and over again. And yet we're still looking for it. And the reason is because energy is the most fiercely guarded sector of all industries, even far more so than the pharmaceutical industry, which is killing us and poisoning us on a daily basis. But it's through the suppression and the control of energy that we are most enslaved, more enslaved than most of the other sectors. And this is really the the hurdle that we need to look at to cross as quickly as we possibly can because that will truly liberate humanity to reach our potential as divine co-creators of our own future reality so free energy has been discovered what are we actually doing here still looking for free energy or alternative energy what we're we doing here is we are trying to outsmart and circumvent those that have stopped the flow of free energy and these are these characters called the banksters and their private money. And it is these banksters and these secret societies, as Sasha Stone calls them, the Babylonian clad, the clan that goes back thousands of years, 
these guys love to show off and hide their symbolisms in plain sight, shoving it in our face. It's on the money that we use. It's everywhere around us. And this boasting with what they're going to do to us and how they're going to manipulate humanity is all around us. It's not just something that's been used recently. It goes back thousands of thousands and thousands of years. So the money stops the flow of free energy. Remember, without money, all energy is free. That is an important connection to make. And no hurdle to progress will prevent us from reaching whatever energy we want to develop. So human origins provides the answer. And I'll come back to the species with amnesia and the great human puzzle, the three fundamental questions that most of us have been asking ourselves most of our lives. Who are we? Where do we come from? Why are we here? The fact that we don't have answers at the click of a button or the snap of my fingers means that we don't know. We're speculating. We're searching for these answers. We are truly a species with amnesia that is waking up from this amnesia. And this is why these conferences are so critical and vital to help us wake up and help being the seeds of consciousness to wake up all those around us, just like David Icke has told us. And, this, and I'm so excited to hear this is happening because I didn't even know that the people's voice was at such an advanced stage of becoming a reality. So. What we find when you start looking at the origins of humankind and the origins of all things, that sound and resonance become the common denominators of all creation stories. It doesn't matter where you look and eventually you will find that it's sound and resonance that come into play. And in Christianity, the word, the Om, the Egyptians sang the word, the universe was sung into creation. And my favorite, the Aboriginal sacred songs, the three sacred songs and brought everything into creation. And you know, just to describe, to, to demonstrate it with some illustrations, it's the six days of creation that are directly and instantly linked to sacred geometry, as we know. It's the six aspects of Om and sound frequencies, and it's all to do with resonance. The six aspects of the all-seeing eye of Horus. This one very obviously shows us that we're dealing with resonance and sound and harmonic ratios. And this is where it also gets far more sinister. Just like for thousands of years, or just like recently, the these secret societies that. Uh, John F. Kennedy exposed in his famous speech in 1961 that eventually I believe led to his assassination. These same secret societies refer to go back thousands of years and they've been leaving these secret um, encoded messages for us everywhere. And this is phenomenal when you start looking at the origins of humankind, how all this stuff is connected. You can't separate anything from anything else. And if you understand how to dissect it, it will give you information and lead you in, a, in the direction that we're hopefully going to get some interesting um, intelligence from the hidden occult messages in plain sight like I'm like I mentioned today just as they were thousands of years ago hidden occult messages of the controlling of the human humanity for millennia it's been going on for thousands of years and the all-seeing eye of Horus many of you may not be aware of this is actually just the representation of the pineal gland how they've taken control of our pineal gland which is really to do with sound and resonance and frequency. It's a frequency receptor, receiver and transmitter that should give us telepathic ability and qualities, which it clearly, clearly does not do. The all-seeing eye of Horus, taking control of humanity. We're seeing these strange bird-like creatures in ancient times taking control through pine cone-shaped tools of this pineal gland of ours and controlling our DNA. Notice what is on this creature's right hand. A very interesting circle with 12 cone-shaped um, um, structures moving towards the center. That becomes important in understanding how this stuff is shoved in our face as to the control of humanity. Controlling the pineal gland, controlling our DNA or tree of life with sound and frequency. Now I'm saying sound and frequency. See that thing on, on the guy's hand once again, looking at that? Because the sound and frequency control continues today through the mainstream media. The all-seeing eye of Horus over there, still controlling us. And on the right here is just half of that thing that the guy had on his wrist. Six of those cone-shaped um, emblems or what do you call logos going into the center, giving, showing us that they, they're still controlling us with sound and frequency the primordial source of control and creation. So what is sound? The, actually, this is a, a beautiful question that there are many, many answers to that we can't go into because that on its own is probably a full week's presentation 
of understanding what sound truly is. And I would also like to refer you to the brilliant work of Don Estes, who's out in Los Angeles, and study what Don Estes is doing and, and uh, finding out about sound. Um, I was going to show you this uh, video, but we, we have very little time today. So I'm going to ask you to go look at this for yourself. All of this stuff is out there on the internet, on YouTube. Go look up the Cymoscope. Um, John Stewart reads brilliant work and look at how they manifest physical form and physical shape out of the human voice. But when you take this a little bit further and you look at some of the, um, the stills of these bubbles of sound of human voice, you start recognizing what... Um, oh, I think, let's see, this is a... Is this a, is this a, a pointer? No, it's not. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, you start recognizing the symbols that inspired the... the or structures that inspired religious symbols. And it's just spectacular. You see how sound starts connecting all this stuff together. And when you drill deeper into it, I, I don't know, did you see that? Did you see this? Can you see the, the cross in the sound bubble here? Right in the center of the sound bubble at the cross section. And when you drill deeper into some of these cymoscope beautiful um, images, you see it. Uh, oh, I'm going the wrong way here. You see it even better. There, I mean, that is as clear as daylight that we're dealing with the source of sound being the inspiration for religious symbols that have taken control of humanity through disinformation. You realize that the, all the crosses of ancient times and uh, have actually come from the inspiration of sound being the source of things. And uh, it's just everywhere when you start looking at it. The carved crosses in rock in Africa that are referred to as Mabona, the Lord of Light, and sound, by the way, as well. Even the medicine wheel in Native American culture is just a cross in a circle that tells us that sound heals, and with sound you can do everything. Even the swastika has its origins in sound. The universe vibrates in harmony, in coherent unity. The entire universe itself has a prime resonance frequency. And I want you to just think about this for a while because it is within this prime resonant frequency that encapsulates the entire universe and the multiverses that it finds itself in. If it didn't vibrate in absolute unity and harmony, it would be in dissonance. It would be incoherent. It will start breaking apart. It won't remain in unity. And therein lies the interesting challenge for humanity to come together from dissonance and disharmony and start uniting and understanding this universal principles of coherence and unity. And in understanding how the entire universe vibrates in perfect harmony gives us a clear indication of where we should be going as a species into the future in perfect united harmony. And I believe that this is what Gene Rottenberry actually meant when he introduced us to the prime directive is actually referring to the prime resonance frequency of the entire universe. If you go against that, you will begin, the, you will basically kickstart your own demise. You cannot resonate against the entire harmonic resonance of the universe. You will destroy yourself. Now with this understanding, we need to move forward and stop destroying ourselves and vibrating in coherent unity. Sound and resonance, it levitates, it boils water, creates light, spontaneous generation of DNA, it heals, it destroys pathogens, it melts metals at body temperature at around 104 degrees, the hardest metals that you can find. It's a precursor to electromagneticism, electromagnetic fields. In, in 2011, Luc Montagnier discovered that uh, you can spontaneously generate DNA just by exposing it to 7 hertz. And for this, he was excommunicated. I heard the other day that he now lives in China. Instead of willing, winning a Nobel Prize, he had to go into hiding. Peter Davy. This is one of my favorite examples of what sound can do. And Peter Davy inadvertently gave us free energy. I'm saying free. It's sort of getting there, right? Because from 1940, this guy's been boiling water with sound. Okay, now this is the first video I'm going to show you. Because the last year, I don't think I showed this. Can we just have a look at this? A 92-year-old Christchurch inventor claims to have come up with a novel way to make a cup of tea. 
He's invented a contraption that he claims uses the power of sound to boil water. Beverly Lockhart went to investigate. It looks like a desk lamp is cool to the touch and appears to be doing nothing until it comes into contact with water. 92-year-old former Spitfire pilot Peter Davey claims his invention uses the power of sound to boil water. Yes, I are. Uh, they, uh, they're a bit baffled how it works. Nobody really knows how it works. Davey believes high-frequency sonic vibrations emitted from within the silver bulb cause the water to boil. He says the idea came to him 50 years ago when he noticed different saxophone notes caused different household items to rattle. The mains powered gizmo has experts intrigued. Never seen anything like it in my life, as they say. Professor Williamson has his doubts about Davy's acoustic theory and suspects there are two simple electrodes inside the boiler. It's the conductivity of the water that provides the the path for the for the current and provides the resistance to give the heating. I'm careful of, that I don't divulge everything. I'm waiting to get a manufacturer that's prepared to put some money into it. And if he does get it on the shelves, he's already got one interested customer. If I saw one in a shop, I'd buy one because I, I, I think they're an interesting little bit of technology, however it is they work. They work. But for now, Davy is savouring his gizmo's success and sticking to his own unique theory on how it works. Beverly Lockhart, 3 New. So, inadvertently, Peter Davy gave us, came very close to giving us free energy because how much water do you want to boil? If you can boil water with sound, how much water do you want to boil? With a sound frequency generator and a car battery and a solar panel, how much water do you want to boil? That can drive the turbines, that can replace the coal, that can replace the nuclear reactors, how much water do you want to boil? And unfortunately, guess what happened? Money got in the way. Money got in the way. He died two years ago, taking the secret to his grave. I'm astounded in the whole world. I've been on this for five years now, sharing this information. And out of the brilliant scientists and minds out there, nobody has come up with this frequency that boils water. And uh, the bright minds out there should be able to do that in 10 minutes flat in the laboratory. So please people, if you know scientists and researchers that have access to laboratories that know how to do this kind of stuff, make them find out the, re the resonance frequency of boiling water and let's put this out there for free for everybody. Not try and make billions of dollars out of it and that was Peter Davies problem. For 50 years he sat on this trying to get someone to put money into it so they can create production lines, so they can sell it to the world. Therein lies the trip. That's what humanity gets tripped up all the time. The money gets in the way. Acoustic levitation. Um, how many of you have seen this? Just by show of hands. Okay, good. Not too many. So let's show this because I don't want to bore you with this stuff. David Deke, by the way, has disappeared. I spoke to a lady at Contact in the Desert that used to work with David Deke in the military. Most of the stuff was done while he was working for the military. Um, he has disappeared. She can't trace him. I don't know what happened to him. Uh, this is a rare video of, of uh, acoustic levitation using sound to levitate matter. Can... Uh, can we click that and uh, show it? <clears throat> Not working? Okay. Notice there are two, two forces of the sound, uh, two sources of the sound frequency, and these polystyrene items are levitating at the crossing point of, these, of the source. Um, and you can make it spin, you can make it bounce up and down, you can make it rotate, you can make it uh, tumble, and you'll notice all these amazing things that, that he does with it. Um, and it just, it's important to see this because we, we hear stories about sound levitating things, but until you actually see it, you still imagine it's just a myth, you know, some crazy old, old folks story. Um, Yeah, what? Icon, yeah. <laughs> Notice the subtle frequency change, how it tumbles and spins and does all kinds of interesting things.
and the slightest frequency change and it starts to spin like crazy. So you can let your mind run wild and imagine the applications of sound doing things, not just levitating, but creating drilling technology and I mean pumping technology and anything you can imagine. So you see, it's true, sound does levitate. It's not just an old wives' tale. My favorite one is the Aboriginal creation story because it really explains the sound and cymatics principle, how matter can be turned into sound, um, how, how sound can, can turn matter or manifest uh, physical form, should I say, and how beautifully this gets explained in some of the latest um, cymatic experiments that have been done. Once again, I'll point you to John Stewart Reed and Co. with a cymoscope uh, and you can see the, the picture on the right is actually one of theirs as well that shows you the torus field that these sound frequencies make. Um, and, uh, but the Aboriginal creation story says, time began when the supernatural beings awoke and broke through the surface of the earth. Can you see they explaining cymatic uh, activity? Um, and they moved about the earth, bringing into being the physical features of the landscapes with their three sacred songs. I mean, this stuff is so encoded with advanced knowledge of sound and, and cymatics. And let's, um, let's just show this little clip. This is from Hans Jenny's brilliant work in the 60s already. But it really shows you how sound can create mountains, not just beautiful patterns. And there's a, there's a lot more of this on, on the internet. Just go look for yourselves. Circular shapes appear. But these are in a state of continuous upheaval. The particles are pushed outwards from the center and inwards again from the outside. And at the same time, they pulsate. We can recognize the various patterns of the vibratory fields. They move to and fro, unite, and separate again according to the vibratory state of the surface formed by the membrane. And we can, as it were, move over a landscape which is in a state of vibration. If we intensify the note, if we produce a crescendo for the ear, the masses are hurled outwards. We see fountains, eruptions, explosions almost. But invariably, the particles return to the center, so that here again, even under these violently dynamic conditions, we find there is circulation. So there we witness the supernatural beings rising through the surface of the earth, bringing into form the mountains and so forth. So it's just a beautiful example of that. Sound is free energy. It's a primordial source of all things. And in, in fact, 
there's an interesting thing that I'm sharing with you here. The aum actually equals 440. The numeric value of that is 440. And I refer you to Willem de Swart's brilliant work on secretnumbers.org um, to verify what I'm, sh what I'm sharing with you here. Nikola Tesla, I believe, uh, actually used a lot more, did a lot more with sound than most of us would realize. And one of his most ignored statements is that the earth rings like a bell and if you tap into the sound frequency of the earth you've got an inexhaustible source of energy and I really believe that that's probably what he was using more than anything else uh, using sound of Gaia to generate the unlimited free energy that he seemed to have shared with us and what does this have to do with ancient civilizations and our evolution of consciousness everything because it's now very clear that the ancient cultures used sound and resonance and frequency to do everything they did the spectacular structures that they built around the world and uh, and all the mystery that they they left for us to unravel we're starting to unravel it because we starting to understand that it was sound that they used this is brilliant um, the brilliant work of um, um, and now I have a com complete blank forgive me um, uh, that <laughs> I should have put it there on, on, on this with the with the, the permit using being a, a giant um, sound vibrating dynamo and this is interesting because there's some photographs that clearly show that there's still some interesting waves and frequencies coming out of the pyramid that we don't understand and can't explain so there's a lot of uh, support for this uh, even in the symmetrical patterns that come out of Stonehenge clearly indicate that this was not an accident that it was built with certain consciousness in mind and specific outcome in mind because of the coherent and uh, coherent interference patterns that we find coming out of there. Ed Leeds Collin in southern Florida built Coral Castle. I believe used sound to levitate these things and the reason I say this is because uh, he did this incredible thing on his own, moving these giant blocks, carving them, moving them around and building this whole place called Coral Castle on his own. And apparently he did this with what some schoolboys could refer to as ice cream cones in his hands. And this is why I call it the ice cream cone phenomenon. And I got very excited about this and these are the little moments in your research, in your life of research, that change the way you think about things and how you see things because I've been finding ice cream or cone shaped tools around South Africa around the stone circles since the first day I set my foot there and I found dozens and dozens of them all connected to the stone circles and the ancient ruins that we've been I've been exploring and uh, suddenly you start finding these cone shaped tools in Egypt you start finding them everywhere you find them in the Rosicrucian Museum in San Jose in California and guess what these the cuneiform inscriptions on these cone-shaped tools tell us that these were tools utilized for building the, the temples in Sumer and they commemorate the building of the temples in Sumer cone-shaped tools and we start getting an interesting common denominator here uh, the conical tower in Great Zimbabwe uh, and I believe there were actually two conical towers in Great Zimbabwe facing the sky were these possibly the the tips of Caesar technology, I'll see, I believe that you understand why I make these outrageous claims. I was just recently told by people that have been working on the Bosnian pyramid that they've been finding dozens and dozens of cone-shaped stones in the Bosnian pyramid among the artifacts they've been collecting at Sam Osmanagic. I need to ask him to send me some photographs. Um, and then in our eyes we've got rods and cones, right? So when we see movies like Superman, I believe that this is really a gift to be like Superman, to do things with our eyes because of the cones in our eyes. And you'll start seeing why this is not as outlandish and outrageous as first might meet the eye. In the 11th century, sorry I missed that completely, the history of Southern Africa is all about gold. By now you should know this. If you don't know this yet, this is why this is the golden goose and this is why Southern Africa has always been stable. It's never been quite out of control because this is what Cecil John Rhodes made very, very sure of, that it was stabilized for the crown because that's the goose that lays the golden egg and they cannot destabilize the goose that lays the golden egg. And, uh, and this is why it's one of the best kept secrets in the world. And I hope to keep it that way because I want the whole world to come to Southern Africa. So... Um, in the 11th century, we're told by Ahmed al-Biruni that describes the prosperous gold exports from the port of Safala. Now, the, the, 
there's a whole lot of important information about this, but what's fascinating about this is that for about 700 years, along the east coast of Africa, they traded with these beads that were apparently worth their weight in gold. Now, our historians put this in the history books and then we forget about it. We th it's, a, it's an interesting curiosity, but we got to stop and say, why on earth would bees be worth their weight in gold? It doesn't make any sense. Here's a hand of gold, there's a hand of beads. What are you going to take? Right? You'll take the gold. So why on earth would somebody make the statement and why would this have been the case for about 700 years? This is a critical bit of information and you'll see why it connects directly to the beads and their shape. And I think you already know what I'm talking about. <laughs> the history books claim that Southern Africa was sparsely populated. Well, unfortunately, that theory gets blown right out the water by the stone ruins and the ancient sites that we've been discovering and sharing with the world. There are many, many of them, and unfortunately they've been under attack, and they have millions of, let me rephrase it, thousands of them have been destroyed by ignorant um, government officials, forestry, farming, roadworks, town development, thousands and thousands have been destroyed. However, there are many that remain. And unfortunately that they still fall into the realm of cattle kraal, so-called cattle enclosures that people used to keep their cattle in. And that is still what goes out in our history books. I'm going to show you just a few of them so you get an idea. If you've seen this before, please indulge me again. What's important to note that each one of them is circular and yet each one is completely unique. There are no two stone circles that are, that are identical or, or even closely, um, closely resembling each other. They are completely unique. And you start seeing very interesting things as you start studying this. But because we only have an hour, I'm just going to rush through this. And you start seeing some fascinating flower-shaped patterns. Because flowers are pretty, so they built cattle crawl to look like flowers. Right? But you can only see it when you're up in the air. I don't think so. So what's going on here? Notice how they connect it by these channels, that everything is connected. And incidentally, Great Zimbabwe is part of all of this. Okay? It is not excluded. In fact, we'll realize that Great Zimbabwe is the head office or the, 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 the major um, stone structure in Southern Africa. Or as I now have irrefutable evidence that we can't go to in here in this short space of time, that this was actually the Sumerian entity Enki, his domain. And um, thank you very much, Regina. <laughs> and uh, this is what Great Zimbabwe looks like from the side. If you haven't seen it before, it's a spectacular structure. It's a very confusing structure. The current historic evaluation is it was built by the Moors ar around a thousand years ago. That's it. That's where it stops. I have news for them. Um, the problem with the, these stone structures and these cattle crawl is that they aligned with the movement of the sun and solstices and equinoxes and, uh, and also sacred geometry and five factor and so forth. So, and hexagons suddenly come out of it and you realize that these cattle crawl must have obviously been built for holy cows because <laughs> otherwise these guys were really wasting their time. And when you start seeing equilateral triangles that do some really inter interesting things and start tetrahedrons coming out of these structures, we realize we're dealing with something far removed from basic structures, whether they were built for dwellings or cattle, it doesn't matter. This is a whole different level of consciousness. These ancient roads or channels that connect each one of these stone circles, not one stone circle is stand, stands on its own, they're all interconnected. And this is where it really started getting my attention. When I realized that we're not dealing with individual dwellings or individual little structures for some little migrant tribes that were moving around. We're dealing with a vast network of structures that are inter interconnected by these channels that are not roads, as our history books in South Africa call them, roads to drive their cattle on. All of them are connected in one giant grid. Imagine most of Southern Africa looking something like this hundreds of thousands of years ago. What is it all about? You already know. Archaeological drawings from 1939 show us that there are no doors and entrances. And if there are no doors and entrances, and they're all connected, as you can see, like a bunch of grapes, sometimes singular walls and sometimes concentric walls. And now the plot thickens. 
and they all connect it. If they do not have doors and entrances, they cannot be dwellings. They have to be something else. And this is where it gets really exciting. Now we also get the, the real problem of agricultural terraces that cover more than 450,000 square kilometers in a part of the world that was apparently sparsely populated with hardly anybody living there. Who the hell was building the agricultural terraces and who the hell were they feeding? And these terraces are everywhere. Once your eyes get sensitized and you drive around with me, it gets a little laborious because I keep stopping and taking photographs of everything like, like this here. But at least I can show you. Uh, even on Google, when you start looking around, you'll start seeing these terraces everywhere. Uh, and on inhospitable steep mountains in, in Lesotho, where there shouldn't be any terraces, there are terraces. Uh, and here you have a beautiful example. This is right up the, up the road from where I live. I live right in the middle of these, of these ancient structures. Uh, I moved away five years ago from the craziness of Johannesburg. And you can see the, t the channels, the terraces, and the stone circles all held together like a giant spider's web holding them all together and on top of the mountain it looks something like this it goes on from this particular point about 60 miles in a 360 degree um, circumference so what's this activity all about once again it's all about the gold but you already know this and what do ancient texts tell us ancient texts tell us that we are now discovering some interesting interference in human activity by these groups of beings called the Anunnaki. And I cannot stress enough, for those of you that are still speculating or wondering about this, I cannot stress enough the importance of the influence and the interference on human activity by these entities called the Anunnaki. And I urge you to go and do some more research on this because we don't have time here today. The Sumerian tablets repeatedly refer to as this place called the Abzu, and Enki, the supreme um, creator god in Sumerian culture. And Abzu has been giving many meanings, but the primary reference is this is where the gold came from. So if we can find a vast vanished civilization that is connected to the mining of gold, then we must have discovered the Abzu. And this is what I'm sharing with you. Enki's special place below the equator where the gold came from. South Africa and Zimbabwe mainly, with a little bit in Botswana and Mozambique as well. In the Abzu, Enki plans was conceiving where to build his house, where for heroes dwellings to prepare, where the bowels of the earth to enter. Some of these translations are spectacular. A primitive worker shall be created, our command he will understand, our tools he will handle. To the Anunnaki in the Abzu, relief shall come. This is plan the planning of the slave species. The Lulu Amelu, the primitive worker, to help the Anunnaki get the gold out of the ground. And there can be no doubt that it is gold that this is all about. I've taken it out of my presentation because it's just far too long. The gold on its own, as you know, is a, probably a full day discussion. Just why it was gold that they were after. And it is also at this moment, I believe, that Enki did what Gene Nottenberry, uh, where I mentioned earlier, um, first brought to our attention that he did not breach the prime directive because if he did so while he was cloning this new species to help them dig in the ground he would have initiated his own demise that he gave the creature enough in enough um, memory if you can call it that in what the Anunnaki or the Sumerian tablets called the entwined essence isn't that a far more eloquent term for DNA the entwined essence than what we use today and in the entwined essence he gave us sufficient space so we can grow and evolve not just physically but also consciously and this is exactly the stage we're at contemplating our own consciousness and our own existence and finding some fascinating answers and this is where we see Enki's house his technology and what they were doing in the midst of the Abzu to a place of pure waters Enki betook himself in that land, a place of deepness, he determined for the heroes into the earth's bowels to descend. The earth splitter, there Enki established, therewith in the earth a gash to make. And I'm going to show you the earth splitter. By way of tunnels, earth's innards to reach, the golden veins to uncover. How many of these ruins are there? If there were a few hundred or a few thousand, I'd say, you know what, I don't know. But unfortunately, that is not the case. In 1891, Theodore Bent theorized, or he guessed, that from horseback, that there were about 4,000 of these structures. You know, I can still deal with 4,000, but by 1974, Roger Summers did a count, 
based on the technology and, and available information he had and he came up with a really nice uh, number of 20,000. By now we're dealing with a vast vanished civilization already. But it doesn't stop there. It gets far freakier than that, people. Much freakier than that. I entered in 2007 and six months later or 12 months later I counted more than 10 million. No, I did not count one by one. <laughs> I've had that question before. <laughs> but I'm not going to go through the lengthy process that I took. <laughs> what kind of stone is it? Let me go, just go back here. Because more than 10 million, I hope this penny dropped for you. More than 10 million stone ruins. Clearly, there is something going on here that we got no idea about, that history has never recognized. A vanished civilization, we have no idea or clue about what they were doing. But now we do. And that's why we're here. And guess what? They had advanced knowledge of the laws of nature and sound as a source of energy, which I'm going to show you. And this is where my real breakthrough moment came when I realized that the stone they used was a special kind of stone mostly known as hornfells. They also use a very dense kind of dolerite, which to an untrained eye looks just like hornfells. But the common denominator they have is that these stones ring like bells. They conduct sound. As you can see, it's a black stone on the inside and it's got this gray, this reddish brown skin that grows on the stone. It's referred to as patina. This patina grows thousands of years per microscopic layer. So when you pick up tools and artifacts that have got patina of several millimeters thick, it means that that tool artifact must have been created hundreds of thousands of years ago, not just a few thousand years ago. So the patina on the tools and artifacts is a very clear indicator and a good scientific argument that we are dealing with extreme ancient civilizations, not just something a few thousand years old. It conducts sound and it conducts um, light, uh, sorry, it co conducts um, energy. And these stones ring like bells. They, use, they are actually sound energy frequency generating devices or the sources of these that um, I've also figured out how they actually, w how they use them and what they did with them. But just to show you how they ring like bells, I created this, uh, this compilation from previously quite long uh, video clips, if you can play this. you how some of these other stones ring like bells. Um, this is what I call, and when, as you can see, we find many, many of these elongated stones. This one is full of patina. It's thick patina, so it's quite dull, but you can still hear the effect. And this is a, a beautiful one. This one actually rings at two different frequencies. Dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun, dun. They, they're quite large. Look at this. Look at this one. And it looks also like it was inserted into something up to that point. And also, remember, they all ring like bells. This, this one is no exception. Alright, on that note. There we go. That's better. That's what you want. You realize that this thing really rings like a bell and it reverberates for quite a long time. demonstration how these stones ring like bells and they were used in all kinds of ways and fashions just like the unk to create specific vibrational frequencies and specific notes to use as a form and a source of energy um, thanks. so 
the next question is, well, what are these stones made of? Well, they're made of a lot of iron uh, and made of mostly this other stuff, the second most abundant element on earth next to water, and that is quartzite or silica. And guess what we use quartz and silica for in the most advanced technology today? And, and so what are we learning from this? We're learning that you don't have to extract the silica out of the raw material to put it into fancy, shiny little metal boxes to sell to people because you only do that if you want to sell it. If you know how the stuff works, you leave it in its original form because it's infinitely more, more eff efficacious in that original form. You're not breaking this energy around it by extracting it because you want to sell it and leave it in the stone. This is why the ancients worked with stone, because they understand how to use silica, how to use the laws of nature, and all these things around us for their own benefit. So, this is what the stones... Oh, sorry, I'm going the, the wrong way. And, and now that we know that you can store digital information in crystals, large amounts of terahertz in real crystals, you no longer need cr little chips that we put in our computers. I'm suggesting that hold on to your crystals because there's a new law that's going to be passed that crystals are now suddenly illegal. <laughs> because now, you know, we can't have people storing trillions of terabytes of information into one crystal. That's not good for business, is it? So just watch this space. I'm not sure what's going to happen there. You so, the same this one here? So all this stuff is encoded here. Thank you very much. So I'm saying that all these ancient stone structures, as whether it's stone hinges, the pyramids, the stone circles, they all have this information and everything that happened, they encoded in the silica, in the crystal, in the stone. And some 12-year-old kid with an iPhone is going to walk up to one of these soon, plug something in and download all that information. Uh, we just don't know how to do it yet. So watch that space too. So, and it's only really in, 19, in 2009 that the world was introduced to SESA technology. Until then, we only knew about laser technology. Now suddenly they're talking about SESA technology. Laser uses light, coherent light. SESA technology uses sound. Bingo! Here we are, going back thousands of years, suddenly understanding what these ancients did. They didn't necessarily use light. They probably used light as well. But they most likely used mostly sound. Sazer the technology, therefore the cone-shaped tools, the cone-shaped stones, the ice cream cone phenomenon that you find in all these ancient sites from the pyramids to um, Stonehenge to the Bosnian pyramid to all over the world to um, um, Edlitz Kalnan at Coral Castle and these spectacular cone-shaped tools that I've been finding. And then we get to the sacred stone as it's known in African shamanic tradition. And Credo Mutwa, um, actually, uh, I think in the discussion with David Icke, he says that the sacred stone, you can look through the sacred stone and communicate with people across space and time. That was a shamanic way of telling us what it actually is. I think you know where I'm going with this, right? <laughs> so, where's the flagship among these ruins? Uh, Adam's calendar is the flagship, absolutely no doubt. Uh, it was rediscovered by Johann Heine in 2003. Baba Kreda Mutwa was initiated there in 1937 as a young shaman. He calls it the birthplace of the sun, or Inzalo Yelanga, where humanity was created by the gods, not just any kind of gods, one specific god known as Enkai, in Sumerian known as Enki. And here we have African culture connecting with Sumerian culture. Bingo, we have a place where all this stuff apparently went down. And you know what? You do this with this information what you want. I'm going to leave it up to you. Um, the interesting anomalies at Adam's calendar are, and I used to use it as a little uh, curiosity for all the macho guys that came there with their wives, you lose GPS signal. As you walk in there, as you cross the imaginary line, you lose GPS signal. And it's really a curiosity until we discovered why the hell that's going on. So that's what it looks like from the helicopter. The tree on the right is north, the tree on the left is south, the two stones in the middle are, are the central calendar stones. Look at them as like vibrating plates, more than anything else. And, uh, and down here is east. That stone over there is a Horus stone, actually a Horus-shaped stone, that marks the rise of the sun in the east. And there you go, 3D representation of it, looking from the other direction. And it's over here that Kreda Mutwa believes that humanity was created by the gods in that little area over there. There's some really interesting things that we've discovered, again, not enough time for that, that seem to corroborate that kind of crazy outlandish statement. 
But you know what? You just got to go with the information that we have presented. Now, this is the other interesting thing is when you connect Adam's calendar through Great Zimbabwe, guess where you end up? At the Great Pyramid of Giza. And suddenly we have an interesting connection between the Giza pyramids and what I believe was created by the Anunnaki and Enki himself, uh, or at least he commissioned it. And the numeric value for the biblical Elohim is also 31. And it just so happens to be on the 31 degrees east longitudinal line. So you start seeing very interesting connections that are happening here. And uh, how old is Adam's calendar? Well, I found this interesting translation in situ one of Sitchin's work, works that pretty much describes Adam's calendar almost. I uh, nearly fell on my back when I found this. It says, 40 shah after arriving on earth, Enki built a special place of observing in the deep abzu on the edge of a cliff aligned with his abode in the north and the peaks. It's like, you've got to be kidding me. It's like... I, I just I read this over and over again. I couldn't believe it. I could find something like this. And when you do the numbers based on what Sitchin gave us, it makes Adam's calendar or Enki's calendar about 285,000 years old. And if that's where humanity apparently was created, guess what? The numbers still fit based on the mitochondrial Eve theory, isn't it? Or study. So what are these stone circles for? And I think you've already figured this out for yourselves because you're a smart bunch of people at an energy conference, right? And you can see that these stone circles, all of them resemble cymatic pa patterns, cymatic shapes. And that's exactly what they are. They're just cymatic patterns representing the sound frequency in the earth at that specific place. In other words, each stone circle is an energetic plug point into the earth, sucking out the energy through sound at that particular space. Are they all connected, making one huge giant energy grid? And the magnetron plays an important role here. Magnetron is a device we use extensively today in modern technology. And, and, and laser, uh, laser beams created by magnetrons can, can, uh, can cut metal in a split second. So magnetrons are incredibly powerful things. So you can imagine how powerful, powerful a magnetron of about 20 meters in diameter is. When I discussed this with... Um, with uh, Kevin Orlovsky yesterday, and I shared this with him, he nearly freaked out. He, I, I said to him, I, I think that one of these could create more energy than all the power plants on Earth today. And he just shook his head and said, yeah, I believe it would. So I believe that we're dealing with advanced knowledge of the understanding of the laws of nature and using sound as the source of energy. I'm going to come back to this. So we're looking at one giant energy grid, creating huge amounts of energy, all connected, all for the mining of gold, and whatever else we haven't figured out yet. So the reason I know this is because we've measured it. We've measured electromagnetic activity. We've measured sound frequency. We even measured the decibels at which these frequencies come out of the walls, these stone walls. Now, uh, I know that... How much time have I got left? Five minutes. Is that... Oh, jeez, okay. Uh, uh, okay, because I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip through this because the, the important thing I need to con make the connections... We've measured the sound frequencies over 300 gigahertz coming out of uh, Adam's calendar. And I know that this doesn't make sense to a lot of you, that, that we're still struggling to understand what sound really is. Um, but uh, electromagnetic activity runs either horizontally or vertically. At Adam's calendar, this, this, uh, the, the sound frequencies um, are above 375 gigahertz. Only when It's literally like you step in there and it goes crazy. Right Out there, there's nothing. You do this and it goes crazy. The electromagnetic fields run at um, incredibly high um, uh, frequency at megahertz, megahertz and it's growing. In fact, when we recently measured it, it was even higher than this. And it runs horizontally around the circle, but then vertically between the two central calendar stones. And uh, this is what you find there. So we're actually dealing with an, <laughs> with an active vortex. This is what, what Adam's calendar actually is. And what is it for? What were these Anunnaki all about? They were about the gold, and it seems they were taking it off the planet. So I think that one of these and many of these around the world could have actually been there for beaming up the gold. And for other interesting applications that we haven't considered yet. But, when we get to the sacred stones, um, there are hundreds of thousands in southern Africa. All the farmers have them, but that doesn't mean they're easy to find. Now, I took one of these stones with me when I came on my American tour in July. I packed it in my bag, and uh, it's actually that one over there. It is the best specimen that I had. I packed it in my bag, and, um, and you saw Daniel Nunes, you saw these guys, and, uh, and I brought it because I realized we're dealing with vortex coils and vortex technology here. And, um, and I 
So this is what it is. I'm just jumping the gun here. We've got no more time left. So, uh, and this is why the beads were worth their weight in gold, by the way. Because they represented these sacred stones that were actually given to the people by the gods that could create huge amounts of energy for all the stuff that they were doing there, connected to the mining of the gold. But this is me handing that particular stone to Nassim Haramein. But the journey there was the interesting part. And I think I'm going to end on this because uh, we, we have... A little bit of time. So, when I was leaving South Africa, I already knew that these stones had incredible energy in them because we measured it. And I knew that I didn't know what was going on, but I knew that I needed to hand it to somebody that could do research with us. And I hope Nassim's going to come back to me with some interesting feedback soon. Um, I really hope so. So, we packed it in my bag. My girlfriend Louise said, We've got to take something to Nassim. He's working with resonance, with sound. It's a resonance project. They'll do something with it. So, wrapped it up in bubble wrap, put it in my bag. We deliberated, should I put it in my hand luggage? Should I put it in my bag? And eventually, I put it in my bag and we checked the bags. We left South Africa. We arrived in Doha on uh, Qatar Airlines, no problems. As we're leaving Doha to the United States, we now go through what? NSA and Homeland Security. We're about to take off. And the captain says, okay, cr cr close doors, cross check and blah, blah, blah. Five minutes goes by, nothing. We're still sitting on the tarmac. Nothing's going on. Suddenly we hear, Louise Clark, please identify yourself. So I look at Louise and I go, oh my God, Louise, what have you done? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, uh, and, and she puts up a hand. The air hostess comes and says, oh, please follow me. So I go, I'm not letting her off this plane on her own. So I follow her out. They march her down the, uh, down the stairs onto the tarmac. There are five guys with guns standing around my bag. And I go, oh God, so what's going on here? So I follow Louise down. I say, what are you doing here? Get up there. So I go back up the stairs and I say, that's my bag. I say, okay, well, you come down here. And, and then all this you know, confusion because they cross-labeled cross our bags. So suddenly when I saw my bag, I knew, oh my God, it's the stone. The stone's in my bag. So what's going on? And um, so they say, what's in the stone? Whatever is in there is a security threat. Please open the bag. So now they're getting very itchy, very, very nervous. And as I'm opening the bag, they don't know what's coming out the bag. So they're like getting... Uh, <laughs> And I'm as I'm opening the bag, I'm thinking, what am I going to tell these people? It's a, the, my sacred stone. I don't want them to confiscate this. I've got to get this to Nassim. And uh, so I'm thinking, what am I going to say? And as I open it, I think, oh, African curios. Yeah, African curios. Because it can't be exotic material. Exotic material is not allowed. But African curios is allowed. <laughs> so, and it worked. I show them the stone after taking about two minutes to try and open the bubble wrap because it was really tightly wrapped and they're getting more and more nervous with every second. And what I did not know at that stage is as I'm showing them this, I said, oh, you see African curios. And I go, there was one African guy there. And he looked at this, he went, oh, I've seen those before. And he walks away. While the other guys are still shaking theirs, they don't know what's going on. Okay, well, put it back. By this time, the captain's come out there. He says, what the hell's going on? If this, plane's in, uh, if this plane isn't in the air in two minutes, I'm offloading the plane. So... As Louise is walking back, she heard one of the guys say, whatever is in that stone crashed the system. <laughs> so, all along, I hadn't known this yet, but I knew it obviously triggered something. But all along, as I'm opening the bag, while I'm a little nervous with these guys with their fingers on the trigger, I'm thinking to myself, the stone works. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> that's the key thing here. You can imagine, they scan these bags with all kinds of things and probably ultrasound frequencies. One of those sound frequencies must have gone into the center of that and created a pulse that just shut the whole system down. And this is what we need to work with. Vortex coil technology. And if I believe that if it's made out of stone, it is infinitely more powerful than if you make it out of wire. So I've been talking to Daniel and to, um, and to Randy about how we take their knowledge and convert it into these. Maybe we take these stones, we, we measure them, we image them, we, we print them out of the 3D printers, then we cover them by crushed dolerite, um, and, and we've got a simulated sacred donut that will hopefully... <laughs> yes sacred Ra randy's donuts are going to become sacred donuts yeah. so so we have free energy people the the ancient civilizations of southern africa have given us free energy and we just need to figure out how to tap into it 
my brief discussion with Kevin Ar Arlowski yesterday uh, made me very excited because I believe he's one of the few, few people that will understand how to do this. Now, um, I'm not going to go through this. You can look at this, the transport levitation, the electromagnetic, the channels between the, the circles were actually transportation devices, things levitated above them. It's called quantum locking. Go look it for yourself. You'll freak out when you see it. It's beautiful. But I want to share this with you because this is really the major breakthrough and I'm going to take five more minutes to end here. Ancient cultures um, uh, knew that there was an energy grid around the world. We are only rediscovering this energy grid and it seems to be that these ancient cultures built all their sacred temples and sites on these nodal points of these energy, of this giant energy grid around the world. And this is what you find with all the ancient sites, right? And there's Adam's calendar, look, right there. Bang! And the pyramid right above it. And there's something over here. I don't know what that is, but we need to check it out. <laughs> <laughs> So play with this. Go look on Google Earth and you'll find things. And please email me if you do find. Share it. So this is phenomenal because then you find this clay tablet. And this is real. This is not even a Sitchin translation. This comes from the Shoin collection in Oslo. And it says, In distant days, in those days after destinies had been decreed, after Un and Enlil had set up the regulations for heaven and earth, Enki, the exalted knowing God, by the rules for heaven and earth, the fixed rules, he set up cities. My God, what are they telling us here? They knew that there was an energy grid that covered the earth and that this energy grid was somehow echoed in the sky. The rules for heaven and earth. This was mimicked in the sky. And there's a lot more information that I can share with you about physical evidence that there is in fact this energy grid in the sky. It is also now evident that the Anunnaki were the ones that put this energy grid in the sky. Two days before I left to come here, I got a phone call from a guy that knows how to measure this stuff. He has no idea that I'm talking about this. Out of the blue, he told me, you know what, I started measuring these weird energy grids above the North Pole and above the South Pole. They're about 20 by 20 kilometers. And then I found scattered fragments of it around the world. It's like it's the remains of some ancient energy grid around the planet. <laughs> And I asked him, can I quote you? And he said, no, rather not. So his I meant mention your name. So I won't mention the guy's name because he's running a little scared at the moment. But there's a lot more information I can share with you on that front. This is exciting because remember what it says here? The rules, the fixed rules for heaven and earth. And then suddenly I discover that, um, that David Wilcox has been talking about these rules that are encoded in the emblems of the, of the Air Force and the Army and whatever in the, in the military. And they refer to these bands around the earth as the rules. They don't know where they come from, but they've always been there. Well, guess what? The Sumerian tablets just tell us where they come from and who put them in place. And that suddenly brings us to what the ancient temples were, that they built on all these nodal points of this flow of energy around the planet. And this is, the, for me, been the aha moment of the last four or five months, linking the energy devices in South Africa, which I sure now, hopefully you agree with me that there are real energy devices, with the other ancient sites. What were these ancient sites all about? Because when you look at them, many of them, they're just too many pillars and not enough space. But we're still told that it's for the worshipping of this God and the offering of this here. And then meat over here and bread over there. And then you go to worship there. And then you go over there and you sing. And it's like, it's, sorry, it just doesn't make any sense. It's all nonsensical, not crap that they you know they're feeding us so what i also found that this this obelisk actually rings just like a bell when i put my ear next to this and hugh newman tapped on the other side i i, I couldn't believe it it's just like those stones that i was ringing they ring like bells these obelisks and i realized that they actually giant antennas and we're dealing with our advanced technology on a gigantic scale and the fact that um that too many pillars and not enough space that these pillars were actually giant antennas either sucking energy out of the sky or putting energy back into the sky or possibly both. And this is where it gets really exciting because I realize that this advanced technology on a giant scale has got nothing to do with worshipping gods and making offerings. But in fact, when you start looking clearly at these, they don't make any sense. Look, these weird um, rectangular structures and geometric structures that many of them don't have doors and entrances, just like the stone circles. And you realize what's going on here. Um, 
and even at the Parthenon. When you look around the Parthenon, the, the main structure there, the remains of a lot of geometric structures. And the Greeks, by the way, didn't build the Parthenon, they inherited it. Just like the pyramids were inherited. And when you start looking, and there's this amphitheater that leads to this entrance, and it's connected to this entrance. Too many pillars, not enough space, weird geometric structures and shapes that don't make any sense. And here you've got another one. These giant things connected to what they say is the, the dwelling quarters, the living area. But it doesn't look like a living area when you look at it at all, actually, because many of them have weird looking entrances and it doesn't make any sense. And this is my one of my favorites. Look at these, just these bloody pillars like going crazy. And then that big open area over there. And then you've got concentric circles in front of it. What the hell is going on here? Um, I momentarily forget. Sorry, I, I, I should put it up there, and I'm, I'm uh, silly. Yeah, th and this is this is why I, I found a table uh, at, at next to where Louise and I are visiting some friends in Johannesburg, and there was a book next to our bed of aerial photographs of ancient sites. And this is when I had this epiphany when I started, because you don't often see aerial sites of ancient sites, aerial photographs of ancient sites. And this is where the penny dropped for me. I realize that the temples are actually templates. And you start seeing that it's got nothing to do with worshipping. That these are actually templates and they're giant energy circuit boards. That's what we're dealing with. And, and it changes everything, people. Now we got a connection to the stone circles in South Africa generating energy. And you realize that this is a whole different kettle of fish. <laughs> Right? I mean, look at this. You know, this gigantic. What is this made of? Silica and gold and, and, you know. Silica. Giant pillars made of silica. <laughs> it's insane. Okay? And when you start looking, now, now you just go crazy. Please go. Go and look for this. You'll, you, you're going to go nuts. You're going to stay up at night. Uh, and, and they use water, not just silica, but next to silica, water is just as conductive and contains memory, stores information, just like silica. Angkor Wat, surrounded by silica. And uh, when you look at Borobudur, when you look at the aerial photographs, it looks like it's alive. I took it out of here because I thought it'll save time. It didn't really. But it looks like it's alive. Borobudur, it, it's like vibrating on the photograph. And you realize that these are all energy generating devices. Those are just large versions of these <laughs> connecting to the circuit board over here. Right? And, and guess what? And it continues. Even the Mayas, the, 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 the Mayas and, and, the, and the Aztecs, they just anthropomorphize these layouts of circuit boards so that it doesn't give it away. And you put human beings in there and hides the real purpose for what it is. And, um, and the pyramids, all that weird, the weird mastabas around the pyramids, the, py the geometric structures around it. Look, there you go. There's one pyramid, second pyramid, third pyramid. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and you realize that that's what these things really are. And, uh, and this is the rules, the energy grid around the earth. And guess what? The human sound was the energy that fed the needs. And this is, I believe, these circuit boards were the energy devices that kept this energy grid around planet Earth. And humans were the providers of the energy through their sound. This is why they've got amphitheaters connected to these circuit boards. They get a bunch of people in there, they get them excited, they create a lot of sound, and they kickstart this whole circuit thing, circuitry. And this doesn't, not just at, at, in Greece, but in other ancient sites, there's your amphitheater connected to the circuit board. And... Um, and there's another one, amphitheater connected to the circuit board up on the mountain. We are the source of our own enslavement, people. So. And nothing has changed in 2013. <laughs> Why do churches have steeples? Why do people want to get electrocuted in there? Because they gather in there, they're filled with fear. They think God is going to kill them. Fear is a very strong energy. They sing, they chant, they do all kinds of weird stuff, and that creates energy. And that gets converted into business centers and cities. 
where we make a lot of noise. Human beings are extremely noisy. We never stop making a noise. And it's the sound energy of humanity that seems to feed these creatures out there that feed off our energy. It's not the sound, it's the energetic vibration. It's the quality of the vibration. Well, exactly. But you know what I mean. <laughs> thank you for... Thank you for Absolutely, but unfortunately most of the sound we make is driven by fear because remember we are captives in a planet that is filled with fear. Our entire reality. I know that. You're not. Except, all of us except you. Um, <laughs> because believe me, on some level you are still filled with fear that you may not recognize. It's unfortunately a very powerful thing. These guys have been at it for thousands and thousands of years. They are masters at manipulation. And these are the connecting channels that connect the cities that make the noise, just making more noise. So, people in cities are the source of our energy. And uh, on that note, what have we learned from this? I'm going to leave this up to you because this is all in my new book called Ubuntu Contributionism. Blueprint for Human Prosperity, A World Without Money. And this is where this was leading to. Because... It, <laughs> thank you. So, I'm going to finish here and ask you to please leave from here, because I haven't really shared the last most important part of this presentation. Leave here and be a seed of consciousness. Don't be fearful of what you know. Share it with everybody, because once they've heard it, they cannot unhear it. And whether they know it or not, they will resonate that knowledge and that information with everyone they come into contact with, even if they don't come into contact with them. They all themselves become seeds of consciousness. This is how we're going to exponentially grow this consciousness and release ourselves from this prison planet that is, uh, that is really not our destiny. So, thank you for listening. There's a... towards the center that becomes important in understanding how this stuff is shoved in our face as to the control of humanity controlling the pineal gland controlling our DNA or tree of life with sound and frequency now say sound and frequency see that thing on, on the guy's hand once again looking at that because the sound and frequency control continues today through the mainstream media the all-seeing eye of Horus over there still controlling us and on the right here is just half of that thing that the guy had on his wrist six of those cone-shaped um, emblems or what do you call logos going into the center giving showing us that they we're still controlling us with sound and frequency the primordial source of control and creation so what is sound that actually this is a, a beautiful question that there are many many answers to that we can't go into because that on its own is probably a full week's presentation of understanding what sound truly is and I would also like to refer you to the brilliant work of Don Estes who's out in Los Angeles and study what Don Estes is doing and, and uh, finding out about sound um, I was going to show you this uh, video but we, we have very little time today so I'm going to ask you to go look at this for yourself. All of this stuff is out there on the internet, on YouTube. Go look up the Cymoscope, um, John Stewart Reed's brilliant work and look at how they manifest physical form and physical shape out of the human voice. But when you take this a little bit further and you look at some of the, um, the stills of these bubbles of sound of human voice, you start recognizing what um, oh I think I see this is a is this a is this a, a pointer no it's not <laughs> sorry <laughs> um, well, you start recognizing the symbols that inspired the or structures that inspired religious symbols and it's just spectacular you see how sound starts connecting all this stuff together and when you drill deeper into it I, I don't know did you see that did you see this can you see the the cross in the sound bubble here right in the center of the sound bubble at the cross section. And when you drill deeper into some of these cymoscope beautiful um, images, you see it. Uh, oh, I'm going the wrong way here. You see it even better. There, I mean, the hurdle that we need to look at to cross as quickly as we possibly can, because that will truly liberate humanity to reach our potential as divine co creators of our own future reality. So, free energy has been discovered. What are we actually doing here? Still looking for free energy or alternative energy. What we're doing here is we're trying to outsmart and circumvent those that have stopped the flow of free energy. And these are these characters called the banksters and their private money. 
And it is these banksters and these secret societies, as Sasha Stone calls them, the Babylonian clad, that clan that goes back thousands of years. These guys love to show off and hide their symbolisms in plain sight, shoving it in our face. It's on the money that we use. It's everywhere around us. And this boasting with what they're going to do to us and how they're going to manipulate humanity is all around us. It's not just something that's been used recently. It goes back thousands of thousands and thousands of years. So the money stops the flow of free energy. Remember, without money, all energy is free. That is an important connection to make and no hurdle to progress will prevent us from reaching whatever energy we want to develop so human origins provides the answer and I'll come back to the species with amnesia and the great human puzzle the three fundamental questions that most of us have been asking ourselves most of our lives who are we where do we come from why are we here the fact that we don't have answers at the click of a button or the snap of my fingers means that we don't know we're speculating, we're searching for these answers. We are truly a species with amnesia that is waking up from this amnesia. And this is why these conferences are so critical and vital to help us wake up and help being the seeds of consciousness to wake up all those around us, just like David Icke has told us. And, this, and I'm so excited to hear this is happening because I didn't even know that the people's voice was at such an advanced stage of becoming a reality. So. What we find when you start looking at the origins of humankind and the origins of all things, that sound and resonance become the common denominators of all creation stories. It doesn't matter where you look and eventually you will find that thing called money that keeps getting in the way. So my suggestion, because I'll probably forget to bring this up later, is this is a message to all the inventors, the scientists, the, the bright minds out there that are developing free energy devices. Forget the word funding. Forget the word production lines. Forget the word getting patents uh, launched in favor of yourself for your, for your thing that you've developed. Give it free to the world, people. It's all about free energy. Okay? If you give it out for free, write down the specifications, show the models, show how it works, make sure that you can push at a push of a button, you can share this with the entire world within seconds. That is your best form of protection. Because if you do not do this, you may just disappear. And the same kind of horrible thing is going to start happening to you the more you close the information to the rest of the world. Share your information. Let the spreading of this become your own security. And I speak from personal experience here going up against the banks in South Africa because I believe the reason why I'm still standing here is because we made everything as public as we could. Every single time we were in court, we broadcast the, the court files, the, the audio files. We made sure that everything went out uh, on the internet to everybody as quickly as possible. So, new energy. We are searching for free energy. That's the key word here. Free energy. Why are we searching for free energy? One of the most important areas that I see we completely ignoring here, most of, most of us are ignoring this, is the <coughs> source of energy, and that is sound the source of all things in the, in, in the universe, sound and resonance. And the reason I say this because this seems to be the primordial source of all things from whence all things come. Free energy. Why are we looking for it? Because we've discovered free energy over and over and over again. And yet we're still looking for it. And the reason is because energy is the most fiercely guarded sector of all industries, even far more so than the pharmaceutical industry, which is killing us and poisoning us on a daily basis. But it's through the suppression and the control of energy that we are most enslaved, more enslaved than most of the other sectors. And this is really the added sound and resonance that come into play and in Christianity the word the om the Egyptians sang the word the universe was sung into creation and my favorite the aboriginal sacred songs the three sacred songs and brought everything into creation and you know just to describe to to demonstrate it with some illustrations it's the six days of creation that are directly and instantly linked to sacred geometry as we know it's the six aspects of om and sound frequencies and it's all to do with resonance the six aspects of the all-seeing eye of horus this one very obviously shows us that we're dealing with resonance and sound and harmonic ratios and this is where it also gets far more sinister. Just like for thousands of years, or just like recently, the, the secret societies that 
John F. Kennedy exposed in his famous speech in 1961 that eventually, I believe, led to his assassination. These same secret societies refer to go back thousands of years and they've been leaving these secret um, encoded messages for us everywhere. And this is phenomenal when you start looking at the origins of humankind, how all this stuff is connected. You can't separate anything from anything else. And if you understand how to dissect it, it will give you information and lead you in, a, in the direction that we're hopefully going to get some interesting um, intelligence from. The hidden occult messages in plain sight, like, I'm, like I mentioned, today, just as they were thousands of years ago, hidden occult messages of the controlling of the human humanity for millennia. It's been going on for thousands of years. And the all-seeing eye of Horus, many of you may not be aware of this, is actually just the representation of the pineal gland. How they've taken control of our pineal gland, which is really to do with sound and resonance and frequency. It's a frequency receptor, receiver and transmitter that should give us telepathic ability and qualities, which it clearly, clearly does not do. The all-seeing eye of Horus taking control of humanity. We're seeing these strange bird-like creatures in ancient times taking control through pine cone shaped tools of this pineal gland of ours and controlling our DNA. Notice what is on this creature's right hand. A very interesting circle with 12 cone shaped um, um, structures moving What does a guy that studies ancient civilizations and rocks have to do with uh, breakthrough energy and new energy and free energy? Everything. Because it seems that we're finding more interesting answers to the questions of new energy and breakthrough energy and free energy from the distant past than what we're finding today. And this is what I'm going to be unveiling today because this is incredible breakthrough information that needs to be shared with everyone. And I believe we're sitting right on the edge of truly giving the world a deep understanding of free energy by exploring the past. But unfortunately, we remain a species with amnesia. And uh, this is a big problem for us. We have no idea who we are, where we come from, and why we're here. And in this um, deep state of amnesia, we forget that we can look at the past to learn about what we should be doing about the future. And this is really what I'm going to try and do here, is to connect the dots, to see what we can learn from ancient civilizations that can benefit us not only today, but into forming the kind of utopian future that we all believe we should have as living, breathing human beings, and not pieces of paper called um, uh, straw men and things like that, or legal, legal fiction and things like that which I might get into if there's time at the end. So, um, the Breakthrough Energy Movement, here we are, it's the second year. I was in Holland last year, and so I come here with a, with a heart filled with joy and hope, but at the same time I come here with deep sadness, because where have we gone in one year? Absolutely nowhere. The same talk about free energy and promise, and six months down the road, and 12 months down the road, and nothing has materialized. And that, that is fundamentally what I have a big, big problem with. And the reason why things aren't materializing is because of the greed of humanity. And 